As we are always logged in and online, the world is gradually becoming more and more dependent on cyberspace. Tactics Institute today presents its report titled Surveillance, Elite Hacking and Democracy, How the West Sells Means of Repression to the Middle East. The report outlines various arguments and viewpoints through three chapters. The three chapters look at the proliferation of military-grade know-how from security personnel to states, which can exploit it for surveillance, elite hacking, and human rights abuse. This dissemination of know-how from democratic to authoritarian regimes poses serious challenges, particularly in a world ever more digitalized. Democracies are national. The internet is global. And that is a fundamental challenge to the internet much before smartphones were ever invented. To discuss this report today, we shall be talking with Alan Brill, a Senior Managing Director with Kroll Cyber Risk Practice. Good evening. Good afternoon. Brigadier General Metavi Hedjiana, a Military Security Analyst and an Associate Professor at the Military Academy General Mikhail Apostolsky in Skopje. Hello from me. Ritesh Kotak, a cybersecurity analyst and consultant. Hello, everyone. And Angelus Kaskanis, an award-winning security studies analyst specializing in transnational terrorism. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here with you. Good evening to you all from me, too. Um, so let's start today's discussion with cyber democracy. Um, as many people, in fact, don't know what that is. So the question is, what is cyber democracy and how is this being challenged? Alan Brill, would you like to take the first? Oh, it's always good to be at, the, at one end of the alphabet, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, cyber democracy is really how we implement the concept of democracy in cyberspace. And the problem with that is that we always talk about the, the concept of cyberspace, but the, the truth is there is no such place as cyberspace. Everything happens in the real world. So the disconnect, I think, occurs when we make the assumption that this cyberspace somehow operates differently that because it is transnational, because it, it admits of no real borders, that somehow it's different or better. And the truth is that cyber democracy is an implementation of what we do in our own countries. And sometimes our thinking is more limited to our own country's experience. And we may not think of the fact that taking something that works within our borders and converting it to global uh, use can have an unexpected effect. And one of the things that I've been looking at for many years is, is something that's, that's sometimes known as the law of unintended consequences. And that is that something that seems like a good idea can in practice turn out to be problematic, partially because we didn't really think of what could go wrong and build that into our thinking. Mm -hmm. Metodi? Well, I... Pretty much agree with Al. Uh, I agree that uh, the two worlds, uh, as we used to say in the past, uh, have merged and they've blended. So there is uh, no uh, real border between the physical one and the cyber one. So I do agree that uh, democracy reflects, democracy that we practice in our society reflects in the cyber world. Uh, the problem with the cyber world is that uh, there are many new gadgets, new things, uh, basically that have a disruptive nature uh, of those modern technologies that uh, somehow stretch uh, the existing concepts uh, and um, the systems that we have established throughout the years or throughout the history that basically are not or are uh, 
constructed under the different assumptions, basically that reflects the real physical worlds. That is the uh, to distance, to traveling, to physical borders, uh, etc. So basically, uh, many there are many reports that emphasize the ability of this the new technologies to disturb the deep values upon which the legitimacy of existing social orders rests, and on which acceptance of the legal and regulatory, uh, legal and regulatory uh, frameworks draw. The challenge, basically, and concerns of these technologies are that these technologies are entering the fields where already regulatory regimes are under certain strains. Uh, uh, take uh, artificial intelligence now and uh, how artificial intelligence is entering the cyberspace. Basically, that uh, is uh, already uh, under the comp uh, uh, complexion of many laws and regulatory regimes that uh, uh, overlap. So I would say that uh, the question is uh, not whether does, uh, whether cyber democracy exists, but how do we approach to cyber democracy and uh, how new technologies basically we uh, uh, find a way to, regu to regulate the use of these new technologies. Ritesh? Thank you. Um, and again, thank you so much for, for having me. And I hope everyone watching this and, and all of my fellow panelists are, are doing well. And um, especially given the uncertain times that we're, that we're living through, we would probably be doing this in the physical world. But you know what? Uh, it's very fitting that we're talking about cybersecurity and cyberspace in the digital world. So when it comes to cyber democracy, uh, for me, I kind of just want to break it up and just build on what my two fellow panelists have already stated. The fact that we used to have things in the physical world and then there would seem to be a push to move to the cyber world where it was just this bucket. If it happens in cyberspace, it's in cyberspace. And that's not the reality. The reality is, is that there's a convergence of these two worlds coming together, the cyber world and the physical world converging into this new hybrid world that we have where things that happen in the cyberspace have real world consequences. And governments are struggling. They're struggling on trying to figure this out. The, ge the geopolitics here, the policy making here is all a work in progress. Take for example, physical borders. And I've had these conversations with the fellow panelists at nauseum when it comes to physical borders and cyber borders. So in the physical world, it's really simple. We have a passport, we apply for a visa, we get on a plane, we land in a country, we go through passport control, and then we get access into the physical world. However, when it comes to the cyberspace, um, the same mechanisms don't really exist. And we get into, we get into the virtual space of, of, these, of these countries. We transact with them. Um, we participate um, with them. And governments are now starting to see the sovereignty issue, the digital sovereignty issue. And as a result, we've had responses that have been on the extremes in some cases. In some cases, they've been quite moderate in some cases they've been completely absent because they just don't know how to deal with it and as a result of sort of these irregularities and inconsistencies it's created a an environment that's ripe for um for disruption and when you can't uh, when governments um don't get this right when society doesn't get this right and we go to extremes that's when we start seeing some of these infringements of of human rights of privacy um, that end up occurring. So my big point when it comes to cyber democracy is if this was in the physical world, we'd be having uh, a different conversation and that shouldn't be the case. We're living in a convergent society and we got to have a discussion that reflects the new realities and we can't take 20, 20th century frameworks and apply them to 21st century problems. Thank you. And Angelus, what do you think about cyber democracy and how this is being challenged today? Uh, so, first of all, I would like to, to share that I believe cyber democracy is a way to express ourselves, express how uh, humanity is monitoring and how humanity is reacting and how individuals are reacting. And then from globalism, we and starting to know each other all from all the aspects of the world and from other planet we went to the cyberspace and we went to the to the cyber world and then it, the cyber world place that uh, there is no time people don't sleep people react and people experiment so 
people started experimenting and started seeing what are the abilities and the capabilities of the system that it was created. And then suddenly governments start to experiment through this, corporations started to experiment through this, and uh, they started to check or see or overview what are the boundaries and what are the freedoms that can be or not be overlooked or violated. So from a point of view, cyberspace gave us more expression tools, more, cyber, more democratic tools, but at the same time it limited our freedoms, and it limited our ways of being safe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, you're all pretty much talking about freedom and borders and um, generally us um, not um, uh, being safe. So this leads me to ask, well, what about data aggregation? Can it lead to human rights violations? And if so, how? Alan Brill. No, Alan is not hearing us. So, Metodi, would you like to take oh, this? I'm, I'm back, but let's go with Metodi. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, when it comes to data aggregation, definitely uh, it always, uh, there is always um, uh, a risk of uh, uh, bridging uh, the existing laws and principles and standards because uh, the, the problem with the cyberspace, as we already described, is that uh, uh, many of the constructs uh, and the regulations that basically exist don't, doesn't fit or we apply existing laws, uh, we, we, what, we go with what we have, and uh, uh, by applying those laws, there are a lot of loopholes or glitches inside the, uh, if I could say, uh, if I could put it in that tech way. So basically, yes, uh, data aggregation could definitely could uh, um, uh, violate uh, human rights, uh, and, uh, but there is always that balance that we have to actually uh, find the right, uh, uh, where is the right point of that balance, uh, whether to the individual's freedoms or in to the collective security. So uh, the other problem with cyberspace is that while when the state was constructed, when the state was uh, established as an entity, uh, there was a trade uh, of uh, individual freedoms. People trade their individual freedoms for the, let's say, safety. Today, when we go with cyber and we, we, we receive all those ser services, there is another trade that is going on. And that's, uh, we are giving our rights and we are giving our freedoms for services. For example, when we, uh, when general people and general public accept new gadgets and they are just going, uh, yes, agree, 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 without reading the, everything that they uh, have to agree to in order to receive the service, just because they are hungry for the service, uh, then this is when the, 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 there is a lack of that awareness, what kind of rights and what kind of freedoms basically we are giving for to receive the service. So that's another trait, and that depends on them. Also, it's culturally uh, oriented, and it's a security threat, uh, basically security perception oriented. When I say culturally oriented, there are people that basically, like Western tradition, in Western tradition, liberties and uh, human rights uh, have a uh, rather more emphasized uh, dimension. When it comes to security threat perception, uh, you would say you would see that there is a change the people are eager to change their freedoms for the safety and security and that has uh, come in several options and in many uh, in in uh, uh, many different times let's say when it when the war on terror came uh, uh, popular uh, many people uh, basically uh, were ready to allow state to have specific certain function that previously was in unimaginable. Uh, if we can look into the several European countries' law, how they changed uh, um, under the threat of terrorism, uh, we would see that uh, they pretty much are, uh, have, uh, have tied themselves to the, what is uh, usual to authoritarian uh, laws, uh, saying, let's say, that uh, I, People can have a home arrest. Uh, people can uh, be watched without the warrant, just under the terrorist threat, etc. So it's very similar with uh, cyber, especially with the services, applications, and uh, gadgets that we really don't know uh, what they are bringing behind. Or uh, we we learn this from from uh, let's say 
uh, whistleblower, whistleblower effects. We learned that the government uh, were not hesitant, both democratic and authoritarian, were not hesitant uh, to spy on uh, its own population in terms of security or in the name of security. So it's up to the government's accountability and uh, the level of, uh, let's say, democratic maturity, whether and to what level they were able to basically uh, balance these rights and uh, um, uh, not overstep these rights, uh, people's rights. Mm -hmm. Alan Bro. So I'd like to expand on what my friend just said, and that is that, again, looking at the fact that problems occur very often, not because we want them to occur, but because we didn't think about them occurring. And when you look at data aggregation, you get into a problem, uh, particularly as we move to artificial intelligence, um, of what's called implicit bias. And that is that when a deep learning system is being trained, it learns from the data that it is provided with to the extent that that data is biased, the system learns those biases. It picks up those biases and it causes them to continue to happen. So that, uh, for example, there was in the US a system called Compass. The Compass system was designed to look at the background of a criminal offender and come up with a score that would was supposed to predict how likely that individual was to commit future crimes. And the technical team that put that together used a, a huge training set. But what they never looked at because there was nobody whose job it was to step back and consider these things, they didn't consider that the data that they were using to train the system was very much racially biased. So not unsurprisingly, the system when it was implemented had built in racial bias. And the danger that this calls out to me at least is that in cyberspace, because things are, are, are pretty much international, they can move freely between territories, is that we may think a system is working in the way that we intended it when it's not, when it's implementing biases that it's picked up without the developers even knowing it. And when you look at bias and you, you say, well, why wasn't this picked up? Why didn't somebody notice that there was this problem? You, you're looking at another issue, which is known as automation complacency. And, and automation complacency occurs when things seem to be going well with an automated system. And those who are watching the system tend to tune out when they're supposed to be monitoring the system's activities. So you can build a system with problems, or you can build a system that doesn't start with problems but picks up problems as it learns. And you can then have a system which has picked up problems, but nobody notices either because it seems to be okay or there are those who want the system to have certain biases which might be wildly inappropriate in a democracy, but not wildly inappropriate in other, you know, governmental approaches. So, you know, I think one of the problems is if we trust the technical community to develop our systems and implement them, there's a real question as to, you know, who's watching the watchers as, as 
I learned in uh, my high school Latin class. Who's in charge of stepping back and making sure that what's happening makes sense either for you as a systems developer or you as someone in a country where a system has been implemented. So, you know, I think uh, this combination of faith that the system is working because it seems to be working um, can, can, be, uh, can be problematic. And I just give you a quick example of a uh, self-driving Uber car, uh, which was being tested in Arizona. And a woman walked out between cars, uh, jaywalking, and the car ran her down and killed her. And there were three problems. Uh, problem number one was the safety driver was watching television on the phone. So didn't see the person pop out. The second was that the car's built-in safety systems, the anti-collision system, the emergency braking system were turned off because they wanted to see what the artificial intelligence system would do. And finally, the National Transportation Safety Board discovered that when the system was developed, it was never taught the rule that people can cross a street other than in a crosswalk. So when it saw somebody coming out from between cars, it wasn't sure whether it was an object or a bicycle. And since it couldn't be sure, it kept recalculating. And it kept recalculating for the six seconds between the time the person was detected and the time the person was killed. So, you know, I, I use these lessons to tell me that when software moves in the real world, we cannot make the assumption that it is working the way that the developers intended or potentially that those using the system recognize as being a problem. Ritesh? Thank you. To me, I'm just going to build on, again, it's uh, when, when you follow Metodi and Alan, um, there's, uh, you know, they kind of cover everything, all the major points uh, that, are, that are relevant. Uh, but just building on that, data is the new oil. And Alan makes a great point around implicit bias when it comes to these sorts of algorithms. I, I always say garbage in, garbage out. And there is implicit bias built into these algorithms that essentially are making decisions or assisting in making decisions. And the implications of that are quite grave. I also want to build on some of that Metodi said. And what he said was around people just arbitrarily just going around and clicking, I accept, I accept, I accept. And that in itself is a, is a, is a big problem um, as well, because if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. So if we take these two things where you have this data, you have ample amount of data that's being generated. And on the other hand, you got implicit bias that's built into the decision-making algorithms and you combine the two we start creating a pretty scary picture of what society might actually look like if it's run by algorithms we started to see some of this discussion um take take place um on you know predictive policing or algor algor uh, uh, um, uh, using algorithms for uh different algorithms for policing we started seeing some of these issues start to start to creep up they said if you can predict it you can prevent it well um, the predictions were off and they were biased because of the data that was feeding these these machine algorithms where if you have data that you're only collecting from certain neighborhoods or certain postal codes or zip codes and as a result the you have an over representation on the pot um uh, uh within within the population on the data within your systems and now you let loose this algorithm to make decisions it's obviously going to come back with with decisions that aren't actually reflective of the true nature of the crime that's occurring. You also have, again, when I say, you know, garbage in, garbage out, if that data was improperly collected, if it was illegally collected, um, if you have data that's, again, over-representing 
a particular community, if it wasn't inputted properly, you start running into these problems. And it's because of these problems that we start seeing what, what a lot of people are calling the tech lash and a sort of a resistance against big tech. And you're seeing a lot of these conversations in the United States um, and around the world. Um, a former presidential candidate, Elizabeth Warren, talked about breaking up big tech and regulating big tech because of these very issues and just how much of a effect these organizations have on our day-to-day -day lives. I do want to talk about um, weaponizing uh, weaponizing code and we and aggregating data um, and essentially weaponizing that against a population. It isn't so much around, uh, for me, the, the individual data points that are collected. Yes, they need to be subject to ethical frameworks, privacy frameworks, legal frameworks, different regulatory frameworks. That's absolutely critical, but it's one thing to put out a, to put out a tweet. Another thing to buy something online. It's another thing to have one of those wearable texts that calculates how many steps you're taking in a day. Where it starts to get scary is when organizations start aggregating that data. And when you start aggregating it, you start getting a fuller picture of the individual. Now I know when you're up, when you're sleeping, when you're walking, your location, your buying habits, your eating habits, your, uh, your political views, and you start taking all that information and aggregating it, it becomes extremely intrusive. And we saw this with, um, uh, in, the, uh, in different elections around the, uh, around the world where software and systems um, were essentially used, uh, you know, case in point, uh, Cambridge Analytica, where third party data was essentially aggregated. And once it was aggregated, it could then be essentially used to target individuals for, um, to rile them up or for voter suppression. And it started creeping into the realm of, of impacting democracy and our democratic freedoms. So it's not so much around the data um, in sort of a very narrow indi uh, individual sense, but it's more around the aggregation of the data the, and then the implicit bias built into these algorithms that then go in to make decisions, which then impact our day-to-day -day lives and essentially infringe um, on, our, on our privacy rights, um, on human rights, um, on our legal rights, on our constitutional rights. And the reason for that is this is a unregulated space. We talked earlier on sort of the, the geopolitics, the, the digital sovereignty and what it means to be a, um, uh, a citizen in the 21st century, where essentially um, our data is all over the world, these companies are all over the world, and the challenges that that faces. So individual data is, it needs to be subject to, um, subject to those, those frameworks, but the aggregation of the data, what you do with that data, how it gets deployed, must have more checks and balances, um, and there must be a global outcry of, uh, of sorts to say this is completely unacceptable and the, and the effects that this is going to have on democracy, on our communities is, going, is absolutely unacceptable and we need to do something today to deal with the challenges that we're dealing with today and the inevitable issues that we're going to deal with tomorrow. Thank you for that. Angelos Kaskanis, what do you have to say for this? Uh, I believe it's all about uh, the perspective of who is interested in what. So if I am an individual and I enter the subject world, I am, let's say, addicted to information. I want to learn things. I want to learn what people hide from me. There are conspiracy theories. There are theories. There are uh, data that I don't hear in mainstream media or whatever. So that's why I enter to, to get more information. And then we also have, let's say, corporations that are interested on in what uh, people are consuming, what are they buying, how they are living, how to create new trends, and all this is made there. So they're interested in more or less what is happening right now. And that's also about the uh, government. They're interested in what is happening right now in our lives, but also what we are thinking right now for the future. So there are somehow data that can uh, amplify in predictive, in predictive models that want to see how the citizen will react in this, let's say, law that we can propose. How can the citizen uh, not react on this or how can, uh, how can the consumer buy this or not buy this? 
And sometimes we see that the governments are both corporations and also uh, states uh, that monopolize security or use corporations in order to, to assist them mo keep the monopoly of security. And then we step more and more and go into more deep and then we go to dark web and we go to other places that individuals are not aware or sometimes they don't want to enter but sometimes they are forced or dragged in and because they are they are accepted or vulnerable to cyber attacks or they are accepted to propaganda that comes from space that is the space of the space let's say so the question is how can we regulate this so that we can save safeguard individuality and protect their data and second what uh, what alan said is how the watchers can be watched like how can cy the cyberspace of cyber safes can be uh, overseen and from who who will have this power let's say to to be everywhere Thank you for that. And with that, we're going to have to stop right here because we've run out of time. So thank you all for your time. And for those of you watching, the report will be online on Tactics Institute website next Monday, the 5th of October. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. So